Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Actor James Caan dies at the age of 82. He's known for his popular roles in the movies such as The Godfather and Elf. Unemployment is ticking up now at a six-month high. And a new report shows that job cuts are looming. It does look like maybe employers are kind of starting to retrench a little bit, worried about a possible recession. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he's resigning. What does it mean for the US? And how is President Biden reacting to the news? Some parents' rights groups are not happy with Biden's new council formed to build relationships between parents and schools. They say it's operating illegally. If they are not complying with the law, then you know they should not be in operation. Dutch farmers step up their fight against climate policies that could end their livelihoods and their output. These regulations come as the world braces for the possibility of widespread famine. WNBA star Brittany Griner was back in a Russian court today, this time with a new plea to enter. We'll have the details on her lawyer's latest move. Veteran screen actor James Caan, known for famous films such as The Godfather, has died. He was 82 years old. Khan's family said in a statement on his Twitter account that the actor passed away on the evening of Wednesday, July 6th. They didn't disclose the cause of death. In the 1972 movie The Godfather, Khan played Sonny Corleone. He was nominated for an Oscar for that role. Khan also starred in movies such as Thief, Rollerball, Misery, and Elf. The Twitter statement also said the family appreciates the outpouring of love and heartfelt condolences and asks that you continue to respect their privacy during this difficult time. And now to jobs. New reports reveal that unemployment rose from last week and job cut announcements have hit a 16-month high. This as the Federal Reserve says they could impose even more restrictive policies and recession fears loom. Here's NTD's Melina Weisscup with more. Jobless claims are ticking up. The Labor Department's report today reveals that 4,000 more people filed for unemployment last week than the week before. Applications for jobless aid rose to 235,000, the highest in the past six months. And job cuts are predicted to rise as companies brace for a possible recession. An analysis released today by Challenger Gray and Christmas reveals that U.S. employers announced over 32,500 cuts in June. That's a 57 percent increase from May. To get a look at what this means for our economic outlook, I spoke with Charles Steele, the chairman of economics at Hillsdale College. What's your take on the overall labor force? And do you think that employers are in some way bracing for the possibility of a recession? I think that is a possibility. It does seem to be what is going on. Um, but more interesting is that job openings have decreased to 11.3 million. So that's a drop of about 400, a little over 400,000. And so it does look like maybe employers are kind of starting to retrench a little bit, worried about a possible recession. Steele says there is confusion in the air about the state of the economy. Unemployment or layoffs have not substantially increased and economic activity rose by 2%. Still, the economic output last quarter shrank. Um, GDP was down in the first quarter by 1.6%. And if that continues, of course, that's the definition for two quarters. That's the definition of a recession. This as the Federal Reserve has lowered their expectation for economic growth for the rest of the year. The Fed says they could adopt even more restrictive policies if inflation doesn't cool off soon. And the Federal Reserve's aim to slow down the economy is one reason why gas prices have gone down by about 30 cents over the past few weeks. The thinking is that the economy slows down, that will slow down consumption. And on that worry, we've seen a little bit of an improvement. Uh, oil prices declining, the wholesale price of gasoline declining. In addition, we've also seen some modest improvements in supply. But will this downward trend continue? Now, we did see a reversal today, oil back up 5%. But I think for now, there's enough uh, room that gas prices nationally could still decline 20 to 35 cents a gallon over the next few weeks. But there's still a long way to go for prices to reach a more normal range of around $3 per gallon. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. 
President Biden reacts after UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he's stepping down. What does his resignation mean for the US and for the joint efforts in Ukraine? Here are the details. And I want you to know how sad I am to be giving up the best job in the world. But them's the breaks. Facing controversies in office, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced his resignation Thursday after dozens of government ministers quit and told him to go. But the special relationship between the United Kingdom and uh, the United States uh, runs so deep and it's so important that actually I don't think it really matters who is in Downing Street or who is in the White House. That relationship will continue on regardless. But the transition comes at a critical point for the two countries as they continue to provide aid to Ukraine and are looking to strike a trade deal. Meanwhile, Johnson promising that efforts in Ukraine won't change. That I know that we in the UK will continue to back your fight for freedom for as long as it takes. And Biden issuing a Thursday statement calling the two countries, quote, the closest of friends and allies, with the White House saying. So I'll say this, our alliance uh, with the United Kingdom continues to be strong. Our special relationship with the people uh, in the country will continue to endure. None of that changes. Meanwhile, Biden's statement notably did not mention Johnson by name, a sharp shift from those of his predecessors when previous British prime ministers left office. Luke Coffey is a senior fellow with the Hudson Institute. Coffey tells NTD that Biden's response could have a political consideration. So for many Americans, too, Boris Johnson was viewed as the Trump of the United Kingdom. Uh, so this probably factored in President Biden's lack of response uh, on a personal level. And Johnson said he would stay in his position until a successor is chosen, a process which could take several weeks. And the head of the FBI, Christopher Wray, is warning about the threat of the Chinese regime. He calls the communist regime the biggest long-term threat to national security and the international order. Here are the details. FBI Director Christopher Wray on Wednesday delivered a rare joint statement with the Director General of the UK's domestic intelligence agency, MI5, Ken McCallum. The two leaders of intelligence agencies have a warning. We consistently see that it's the Chinese government that poses the biggest long-term threat to our economic and national security. And by our, I mean both of our nations along with our allies in Europe and elsewhere. Ray and McCallum warned about the CCP's covert theft, forced technology transfers, research exploitation, and cyber attacks. Ray said the Chinese regime sees cyber as the pathway to cheat and steal on a massive scale. And that's not all. But in addition to traditional and cyber-enabled thievery, there are even more insidious tactics they'll use to essentially walk through your front door and then rob you. The Chinese government likes to do this by making investments and creating partnerships that position their proxies to steal valuable technology. The FBI director encouraged business leaders to coordinate with the FBI and MI5 to protect themselves and prepare for future attacks. And his British counterpart also mentioned a false assumption about China that many in the West have believed in the past. The widespread Western assumption that growing prosperity within China and increasing connectivity with the West would automatically lead to greater political freedom has, I'm afraid, been shown to be plain wrong. But the Chinese Communist Party is interested in our democratic media and legal systems, not to emulate them, sadly, but to use them for its gain. Ray and McCallum said that allies and partners in the free world are in this together. They called on those nations to come together and take action to address the threats posed by the Chinese regime. And more on China. Congressman Chip Roy is accusing a former University of Texas scientist of breaking federal law. The scientist signed an agreement with the Wuhan Institute of Virology that has the congressman raising questions. NTD's Jason Perry has that story. Congressman Chip Roy is no stranger to questioning COVID policies. This clip is from July 2021. See, okay, we can't come to the floor. I can't execute my constitutional duty unless I wear a mask. Well, which is it? Vaccines or masks? Do the vaccines work or they don't work? Do the masks work so they don't work? I'd like to know which it is. I'd like Dr. Fauci to come down and answer a single question about nat natural immunity. Now the congressman wants answers from Dr. James LaDuke. 
He's the former director of the University of Texas Medical Branch. In a letter obtained exclusively by the Epic Times, Roy raised concerns of a memorandum of understanding between the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the University of Texas Medical Branch. It was signed by Dr. LeDuc in 2017. One of the provisions Roy wants answers about reads, The party is entitled to ask the other to destroy and or return the secret files, materials, and equipment without any backups. In other words, either party involved in the agreement could demand that all the files related to the joint research be destroyed. Roy said this violated not only the National Institutes of Health policy, but also was in violation of state and federal laws that required the retention of records. Roy added, it raises serious concerns that a prominent recipient of federal taxpayer dollars would enter into an agreement with any foreign entity, but especially an adversary with such a glaring memory hole provision that authorizes research materials and files to be destroyed upon request. Roy then asked several more questions, including whether LeDuc destroyed any files corresponding with the agreement and whether UTMB entered into similar agreements with China or other countries. We reached out to the University of Texas Medical Branch for comment, but we didn't hear back before airtime. Jason Perry, NTD News. And in the U.S., parents' rights groups are suing the Biden administration. They claim the Education Department's new parents' council is illegal. NTD's Arlene Richards finds out more. Ian Pryor is the president of Fight for Schools, a parents' organization concerned about quality education in public schools. Fight for Schools is one of three groups suing the Biden Education Department. They say the department created a new parents' council illegally. If they are not complying with the law, then, you know, they should not be in operation. The National Parents and Families Engagement Council, created by the department last month, is designed to bridge the gap between families and schools. It's the administration's response to parents' demands for more say in their kids' education. But Pryor says it doesn't comply with the Federal Advisory Committee Act because its members don't represent all parents' views. All you're seeing here is that the you know vast majority of these organizations the high-ranking officials and executives have all donated to the Biden campaign, Democrat campaigns, left-wing causes, whereas none of them have donated to Republican candidates or conservative causes. So it's clearly an imbalance here. Under the FACA, the council must have a membership that is fairly balanced in terms of the points of view represented and the functions to be performed by the advisory committee. Pryor said parents who were on the ground fighting for change in Loudoun County have demands that aren't being heard. And those parents, he says, think the council is a joke. No one has ever reached out to parents defending education, organizations that are really standing up, um, is standing up for parents and trying to hold these schools accountable. NTD reached out to the Department of Education. They got back to us, but they didn't comment on the litigation. Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. And in the Netherlands, farmers continue to protest the government's proposed nitrogen policy. In an effort to reduce emissions, the policy could necessitate the mass slaughter of livestock and potentially shut down almost a third of the country's farms, ending many livelihoods. All this at a time when the world is bracing for a possible global famine. Earlier today, I spoke with Dutch political commentator and legal philosopher Ever Vlaardingenbroek to learn more. Ava Vlaardingenbroek, welcome. Thank you for having me. Tell us, what are these farmers primarily concerned about? Right, so the farmers are concerned about their land being taken away from them. The Dutch government has recently passed a law that now seems to not even have the proper legal basis, actually, uh, that is going to mean that they're going to have to cut 30% of their livestock before 2030. And the government is selling this as a law that is going to solve a so-called nitrogen crisis, which is a non-existent crisis. Um, your viewers can go and, and look the Netherlands up on the map and see that we're a very tiny country that, you know, could not possibly be causing uh, a dangerous nitrogen crisis compared to our neighboring countries who are much bigger that are not subjected to any of these rules. So it's really just a made up crisis by our government because they want to take these farmers' land. The Netherlands is one of the world's largest agricultural producers. In addition to farmers' concerns, how could these restrictions impact the country and the global food supply? 
Well, the farmers have now, in a response to this new law, been protesting. And one of the things that they've done is they've blocked distribution centers. And they've done that because they want to show the, our country and also the rest of the world what happens when you shut down farmers. No farmers means no food. And we can see that now in Dutch supermarkets. We've had empty shelves for days. So the immediate effect is very visible to to citizens and the farmers want to show this is what happens when you shut us down this is not just going to affect us it's not just our heritage our land and our uh, life on the line it's also yours each day more farmers are joining these protests and escalating their methods of protest as you mentioned they're blocking food distribution centers but they're also blocking highways and airports do you see these measures as a desperate plea for help Absolutely, yes. We've had farmers that have sadly already committed suicide because of these restrictions and these regulations, because this, this nitrogen law is really the straw that breaks the camel's back. But they've been subjected to so many insane regulations that have caused them to have to reorganize their entire farms over and over and over again to now finally oftentimes be completely shut down. Um, I've, I've spoken to some farmers who said, I have a, a farm that produces just organic meat and I have to shut down 95% of my company with this. And that farm had been in their family for centuries. So you can imagine that these people are are completely desperate and I can only support them in that and I understand their their cause. Because what would, what would you feel like if someone would come into your house, if the state would say, I'm going to just take 30% of what you own and you have nothing to say about it? And how are police responding to these protests? Well, the police is not on the side of the farmers, which is, is a very sad fact. And uh, we've seen horrible police brutality already against the farmers that have been protesting, which is very uncommon, or I should say used to be uncommon in the Netherlands over the past couple of years. With the COVID protests, we've seen similar events. Um, but yeah, the police has already shot at a 16-year-old kid yesterday um that was he was missed by two centimeters so we almost had a child that was killed by the police just for for peacefully protesting he was actually driving away from the protest so it's it's really insane what is happening here and it shows once again that well dutch people who are unarmed as you should know stand very little chance to the the violence monopoly of our state You've said that these Dutch farmers are rising up against what you've called the communist agenda of the global elites. What did you mean by that? Well, it's communism to the T. If the state comes in and says, I'm going to take away your property for a so-called greater good, I don't know what could be more you know, essential to communism than that. So it's communism, and I'm saying that it's, it's being done on a global scale, because this is part of a bigger agenda than just the agenda of the Dutch government. Yes, it's true that the Dutch government wants the, the farmers' land for one reason is to, to house new immigrants, but this is also because they are following an agenda called the 2030 agenda. These are these are restrictions and, and climate regulations that are that are imposed all over the world. So we're being hit hardest right now, and we might be the first ones, but it's very important for other people to know that they could be coming to you next. As an example of these restrictions in Sri Lanka, the government abruptly banned chemical fertilizers in an attempt to become 100% organic. Now, a food and economic crisis is devastating the country. Do you think we're going to see more of these policies and protests continue? Yes, yes. We already see now that in Italy, farmers have gone out on the street as well. In Poland, farmers are going out. So it's spilling over, which is a really good sign, because like I said, these restrictions are going to be uh, very relevant for everyone, because it's obviously it's a global agenda. They want us to eat bugs. <laughs> they want us to eat the fake meat that they produce. So it's, it's very clear that this is not something that just the Dutch people will be subjected to. And that's why we need your support from other countries. And what do you think Americans can take away from what's happening in the Netherlands? Well, I, from a Dutch perspective, I would say that Americans should be very happy that they have a Second Amendment and that you should protect that with all your, all your strength. Ava Vlaardingerbroek, thank you so much. Thank you. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American?
and Carson Graves. Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. A new sex ed course for kids in Washington state is making headlines around the U.S. For what ages is the course? As young as nine years old. A Washington state school board director is planning the private lessons. Jen Mason is a board director at Bellingham School District in Washington state and owner of a sex shop called Wink Wink Boutique. Mason is planning to hold private sex education classes for nine to 12 year olds in a space that belongs to her shop. Topics include things such as sexual anatomy for pleasure and reproduction, gender and sexual identities, and more. Mason's website says the classes aim to provide empowerment and information rather than shame, fear, and judgment. In my schools now. Brenda Lebsack has been a teacher for almost 30 years and was an elected school board member for Orange Unified School District in California. She told NTD, classes like these may cause children to think the sex they're born with doesn't align with their gender identity. When we talk about gender dysphoria, um, really, they are creating gender dysphoria. She says that classes like those could have drastically changed her life. And I was a kid who, you know, was a tomboy and thought, oh, being a boy is more fun, you know, um, to the point where I was even kicked out of the girl's bathroom. And if I was raised today, I would have thought, oh, just take a little pill or take a shot and I'll become a boy because kids are imaginative. And that could have done irreparable damage for me, probably sterilized me to where I would have never been a mother and a grandmother that I am today. So I think we are really taking advantage of kids, uh, their imaginations, their trusting, their being impressionable. She added that many young people who do undergo gender surgeries end up regretting it or even suffering lasting damage to their bodies. Mason defended her classes on the boutique's Instagram account, saying that sex education looks different at all age levels, but there are definitely ways to make it developmentally appropriate. Her classes are privately held, cost between $5 and $50, and are not endorsed by the Bellingham School District. Reporting by Arian Pazdar, NTD News. Turning now to a national conference focusing on making schools safer, which is currently underway in Colorado. School resource officers are sharing best practices on handling crisis situations amid a renewed focus on school shootings. Here are the details. The annual conference of the National Association of School Resource Officers kicked off in Aurora, Colorado this week. It features speakers sharing best practices on handling crisis situations. Frank DeAngelis was the principal of Columbine High School in suburban Denver when two gunmen killed 12 fellow students and a teacher in 1999. This is what he said. One of the key things that I think it's important most schools are getting into now is teachers being able to lock the doors from the inside. Because what these uh, shooters realize is their time to commit their act of terrorism is going to be very short-lived. So they're going to go to safe targets of classrooms. And we saw what happened in Uvalde. There was a classroom door open. And so I think we need to continue to do that. The convention also features a bustling exhibit hall showcasing the latest in school safety technology. That includes several gun dealers, companies that make bulletproof vests and tactical gear, real-time demonstrations of surveillance cameras, modified window blinds, comfort dogs, and a wide variety of door locking systems. We've got RSOs in Alabama that carry this in a Hello Kitty backpack. Mom and dad don't want to see this weapon in their school, but it's got to be there. It's unfortunate. It needs to be there. An officer from Castle Rock Police Department in Colorado shared the importance of making officers at schools approachable to children. You know, part of this is that this dog will be visible, um, you know, virtually every day that the kids are in school. Um, it makes me more approachable. It also assists me because I am more approachable, you know, when kids feel like there's something going on in the school, if there's an issue or something that needs to be addressed, they're more likely to come visit me. Um, as opposed to just seeing me as, you know, I'm solely there for security and I can't be talked to or approached. The conference has drawn nearly 1,500 attendees. It will run until this Friday. And on broader safety issues, over 60,000 unvaccinated members of the National Guard and the Army Reserve could lose their jobs over the vaccine mandate. The U.S. Army is cutting off their pay and benefits and barring them from military duties. 
Army officials announced last week that, quote, soldiers who re refuse the vaccination order without an approved or pending exemption request are subject to adverse administrative actions, including flags, bars to service, and official reprimands. The Army warned that those who still chose not to get the vaccine could face more dire consequences, including separation. This means the military could lose up to 60,000 troops. And that's why the military is already facing a recruiting crisis. As of July 1st, 13 percent of the Army National Guard and 12 percent of the Army Reserve is unvaccinated. Soldiers with pending exemption applications can continue to train, but exemptions are almost never approved. And President Biden has awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom to 17 civilians. This is the highest honor given to civilians by a president. That's the soul of our nation. That's who we are as Americans. And that's what we see, an extraordinary, extraordinary group of Americans up here on this stage that I have the honor to recognize today with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest civilian award. This year, the medals went to the late Senator John McCain, the late Steve Jobs, gymnast Simone Biles, actor Denzel Washington, and 13 others. President John F. Kennedy created the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1963. It replaced the Medal of Freedom created by President Harry Truman to honor outstanding civilians for their service during World War II. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, what kind of support is there for expectant mothers of unplanned pregnancies and a post roe nation? How some women are choosing life. WNBA star Brittany Griner was back in a Russian court today, this time with a new plea to enter. And TD's Dave Martin has the details on her lawyer's latest move. See China before communism. Behold. A splendid culture reborn, filled with beauty, majesty, and a powerful message of hope. Come see the performance that has touched the hearts of millions. Live on stage. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast cable or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times? I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff? I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epoch Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. Hi, I'm Smokey Bear, and I made an assistant to help you prevent wildfires. Dude, I've got this. I've been camping since I was five years old. But I am a camping influencer. You know what, I'll bet you five bucks. Okay. Assistant Smokey, what is the best way to put out a campfire? Mm -hmm. To put out a campfire, drown with water, stir, drown again, then make sure the fire is out cold by feeling with the back of your hand. Wait, really? I'll take the five bucks. Now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned, many are looking ahead, wondering how the future may change for women and their as-yet unborn children. One woman who has been working with expectant mothers of unplanned pregnancies is Dr. Carice Trandum from Save the Storks, a pro-life organization that helps pregnancy centers to go mobile and reach at-risk women. I spoke with her earlier today. Dr. Carice Trandum, welcome. Thank you. It's a joy to be with you today. 
Now, your organization, Save the Storks, helps women facing unplanned pregnancies. Could you tell me more about that? Save the Storks is a national pro-life organization that really puts women first. So we make sure that women feel supported and have their needs met when they're facing an unplanned pregnancy. Uh, that includes medical, but also social needs as well, financial, um, spiritual, and of any other need that the patient might have. We really are here to support her throughout her pregnancy. A primary service that Save the Storks offers is ultrasounds to expectant mothers. It's been reported that more than 80% of women who are considering abortions who see an ultrasound of their unborn child change their minds. Why do you think that is? When women are able to see the actual life growing and forming within them, they are able to make a connection that that life is real and is a part of them. And I think it makes it more difficult to think of it as just an easy decision to remove that life. And I think it also helps moms really connect in their heart rather than just their head about the pregnancy to really be able to ha begin that bond with their baby. Do you have a story that you could share with us about a, a time that you've personally seen a woman change her mind after seeing an ultrasound of her unborn yeah, child? Absolutely, just today I had a patient come in and she was a 19 year old young woman who was in school and she and her boyfriend unexpectedly got pregnant and she came in asking for an abortion to our clinic and um, she just felt like it wasn't the right time for her. She didn't have the finances she needed and wanted to finish school. But when we were able to be present with her during the ultrasound, she began to cry seeing her 10 week old baby. We could see hands and feet and her baby was sucking its thumb and the baby was moving. Um, and she just said, I, she went through tears said, I, I can't believe that's my baby and I want I want to do this. I want to do this. And so we've we've helped her not only medically, but also we're putting her in a special program to um, help her earn the things that she needs through educational classes on how to parent. Um, uh, earn diapers and wipes and car seats and everything she needs for her baby and then we're going to support her also through our advocates while she's in school to really encourage her to continue with those dreams as well. But now that Roe v. Wade has been overturned, many people are worrying about what this will mean for women facing unplanned pregnancies. What's your take on that? Uh, I believe that Roe v. Wade being overturned is a victory for women's health care because we know that abortion harms women. We know not just mentally, but also physically. There's an increased risk of breast cancer for women who have had an abortion, of uterine damage, of infertility, of preterm birth in the future, and of course, mental health problems. And what do you think is the best way to help women facing unplanned pregnancies? I think the best way to help women with an unplanned pregnancy is really to pray, to pray that they feel supported and then to actively go and love women who are pregnant, whether or not you know that they are planning that pregnancy or not. If you see a woman who's pregnant, just smile at her, support her, surround her, especially if you attend church in your churches, support women who are pregnant. Um, unfortunately, many churches, women who are pregnant without a spouse feel unwelcome or shunned. And so really changing that culture within our churches to welcome women who are pregnant, no matter what their circumstances and really surround and support them. I think those are two big culture changes. And um, then also find your local pregnancy resource center and see how you can help out, whether it's a donation financially or volunteer hours or bringing in supplies for women who need help. Um, and then encouraging your local state officials to really support women who are pregnant and support pro-life laws. Dr. Carice Trandum with Save the Storks, thank you so much. Thank you. 
And turning now to California, where a plan to mandate COVID-19 vaccine shots for hundreds of thousands of students in Los Angeles Unified School District will remain on pause. A Los Angeles County judge ruled earlier this week that the district lacks the authority to do so. A Los Angeles County judge ruled on July 5th that the LA Unified School District, or LAUSD, lacks the authority to mandate COVID-19 jabs for its hundreds of thousands of students. Judge Mitchell Beckloff of the Superior Court of Los Angeles County sided with a parent identified only as GF. His 12-year-old son attends a competitive public school in North Hollywood. The district's mandate required all eligible students aged 12 and above to show proof of receiving a COVID-19 jab or obtain an exemption to attend school in person. Those who did not would be transferred to the district's remote learning program. The father said in a sworn declaration, either I get him a vaccine that I fear could harm him or I send him to a virtual school that I know from experience and LAUSD's own data would prove academically vastly inferior. Judge Beckloff wrote in his final ruling, the mandate is not merely about how education is delivered or who may be physically present on campus as the court previously viewed it. Instead, the mandate dictates which school the student may attend and the curriculum he may continue to receive. Ari Spangler, an attorney for GF, said in a statement, this ruling ensures that no child will be forced out of the classroom due to their COVID-19 vaccination status. The decision does not immediately impact LAUSD. The school district and Governor Gavin Newsom's administration have both put their mandates on hold until at least the summer of 2023. Daniel Hall, NTD News, California. And staying in California, with the drought as bad as, it, as bad as it is, the state will certainly need some help during this year's fire season. And one of the world's largest firefighting helicopters is ready to assist. Fire departments from Los Angeles, Orange, and Ventura counties, along with Southern California Edison, put the largest firefighting helicopter in the world on display. The double rotor helicopter showed what it could do on Tuesday at the Joint Forces Training Base in Los Alamitos, Orange County. Officials said the helicopter, designated CH-47, can deliver 3,000 gallons of water in 90 seconds. So when you just think about it, three times the water is just three times longer of a span that you watch them drop as you watch the different ones drop. So it just gives us a heavier, it just gives us a heavier hit to hit the fire with. And sometimes fires, depending on what kind of fuel they're in, they have so much energy release in them that it takes that extra water to actually quench them down cool enough to put them out. CH-47, along with other helicopters, will go to the most intense fires. Where we're going to take them is on the active flank or areas where there's uh, a lot of fire behavior. Gaylor advised residents how to keep homes safe during fire season, which spans from July to September. Residents need to have all that stuff in place and they can follow that ready, set, go guideline to help them prepare with what they need. And it includes uh, taking important documents, uh, paperwork, medications, uh, supplies for pets, and uh, things that you would need for a, uh, uh, an extended duration away from your home. Keeping wood piles away from their houses, large growth vegetation that are growing up against the house, keep them trimmed or eliminate those are probably the best things that they can do. CH-47 is ready for action as its service began on June 24th. It will be extinguishing fires for 165 days this year. Coming up, we'll be hearing from a man who says he witnessed the horrors of China's forced organ harvesting trade. And Ukrainian forces raised their national flag on the recaptured Snake Island today. Moscow's Air Force was quick to respond with a high-speed missile attack. We'll have more on the updates for you after the break. The Nation Speaks, we don't just scratch the surface. We want to go wide and deep. Our viewers come away with a much richer understanding of the issues of the day. We really make a big effort to bring on different voices onto the show. We don't just talk to experts and newsmakers, which of course are extremely important, but we also want to hear from the American people. So the people who are impacted by the policies and issues that we're talking about, because what they have to say is just as important to the national conversation. A former Japanese criminal gang member says he witnessed a patient being prepared for live organ harvesting in a Chinese hospital. He says the organ came from a Falun Gong practitioner. 
It comes as research published this April accuses Chinese surgeons of taking hearts out from inmates who are still alive. Here's NTD's Jane Werrell with more. And just a warning, some viewers may find the following content disturbing. As evidence mounts, the Chinese regime continues its lucrative organ trade from prisoners of conscience. A former criminal gang member in Japan recalls witnessing it. It was in 2007 that his friend's brother's liver failed, and they desperately tried to find him a liver transplant. To have a liver transplant, if you were to do it, the only option would be to do it in America, France or China. But the waiting time is very long in America and France, and he couldn't wait. It also costs a lot, and the regulations are very strict. So we chose Beijing, China. In Beijing, there is a military police hospital where they receive Japanese people. What about the donor? They said, we can have it ready straight away. He says the family of the patient found the albumin from the Chinese hospital. A protein needed for a liver transplant wasn't good enough. So Sugara helped them buy the solution in Japan and smuggle it into Beijing with a sanction of the Chinese hospital. The day before the scheduled surgery, he was asked if he'd like to take a look at the donor. When I opened the curtain, the donor was sleeping, drugged. He was sleeping. He had surgery to seven tendons in both of his hands and feet the day before. I asked why. One reason was to prevent him from running away. Also, if a donor is tense, the body would shrink, which isn't good for the organs. That's the reason for this surgery. Then leave the patient in a hazy state with anesthesia like a drug. A young and a very good liver, he said. I thought, terrible. He said, there are many people in China, so we can have donors. We can prepare matching ones. And there are so many bad people who have to die so best to utilize them. When he asked the doctor what the man had done, the doctor said he's from a terrorist group, and after pressing more, he answered, Falun Gong. Falun Gong is an ancient spiritual practice that's based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion and tolerance. Falun Gong practitioners have been brutally persecuted under the Chinese regime since 1999. Doctors killed. In 2019, a People's Tribunal held in London found that Falun Gong practitioners were probably the main source of supply for forced organ harvesting, and there was evidence of mass medical testing of the Uyghur ethnic group. There are reports that say the Chinese regime is targeting the Uyghur ethnicity for organ harvesting to market them to recipients in Saudi Arabia. Investigative journalist and author of the book The Slaughter, Ethan Gutman, says the medical community needs to be more aware about how the Chinese regime works. This is a, a deep corruption of medicine. Uh, I, I shouldn't even have to say it's such a thing. It's so obvious. Uh, but the medical world has chosen to obfuscate and to ignore the issue. And, uh, and unfortunately, they find it very hard to climb down from the position that, you know, we should work together with the Chinese to solve this. Investigations show China's organ transplant program to be one of the largest in the world. So far, a handful of countries have passed legislation that would stop their citizens from travelling there for organ tourism. Jane Worrell, NTD News. And turning now to Ukraine, where Ukrainian forces have raised their national flag on a recaptured Black Sea island on Thursday in a defiant act against Moscow. Meanwhile, Russian forces are trying to consolidate control in the Luhansk region and preparing for a wider offensive. The regional governor urges civilians to evacuate to save lives and enable the Ukrainian army to better defend towns. NTD's Joy Dugut has the story. Ukrainian forces raised their national flag on a recaptured Black Sea island on Thursday as a symbol of defiance against Moscow. Moscow was fast to respond to Ukraine's defiant flag-raising ceremony on the island, 90 miles south of the Ukrainian port of Odessa. An aircraft of the Russian Aerospace Forces immediately launched a strike with high-precision missiles on Snake Island, as a result of which part of the Ukrainian military personnel was destroyed. Those who survived fled towards Primorsk in Odessa region. Russia abandoned Snake Island at the end of June in what it said was a gesture of goodwill a victory for Ukraine that Kiev hoped could loosen Moscow's blockade of Ukrainian ports. Russian forces in eastern Ukraine, meanwhile, kept up pressure on Ukrainian troops, 
trying to hold the line along the northern borders of the Donetsk region in preparation for an anticipated wider offensive against it. After taking the city of Lysyshansk on the Sunday and effectively cementing its total control of Ukraine's Luhansk region, Moscow has made clear it is planning to capture parts of the neighbouring Donetsk region, which it has not yet seized. Kiev still controls some large cities. Sloviansk and Kramatorsk. To occupy the part of the region they have not been able to take under control. This part is 45% of the region. At the moment, I cannot say the enemies had any success. The enemy, even if they occupy some land, they have not taken control of cities or towns. Local authorities said at least one person was killed and six wounded in a Russian missile strike on Kramatorsk on Thursday. The strike also damaged six buildings, including a hotel and an apartment block. The governor of the Donetsk region urged citizens to evacuate the region as he said Russian shelling was without a target, only destroying civilian infrastructure and residential areas. He said 350,000 citizens remained in the Donetsk region, compared with 1.6 million in peacetime. Once there will be less people, we'll be able to concentrate more on our enemy and performing our main tasks. The Ukrainian military said Russian forces were moving more units into the Luhansk region in order to consolidate Moscow's control there. In a sign that Moscow is not preparing to wind down its operation any time soon, Russia's parliament on Wednesday rushed through bills requiring businesses to supply goods to the armed services and obliging employees at some firms to work overtime. Joy Dugid, NTD News. Coming up, a bit of light-hearted news. The first footage of three Sumatran tiger cubs has just been released. They were born this week at the London Zoo. Stay tuned for more after this short break. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. The Live Golf League has suddenly emerged as a rival to the mighty PGA Tour. With 26th ranked Paul Casey's reported defection over the weekend, now 22 of the top 100 players have joined the startup tour. But controversy has followed the Saudi funded league. PGA legend Phil Mickelson came under some fire when he talked about his involvement with the Startup League in comments that came out over the winter. Mickelson described the people he was working with as scary and said he knew they killed Washington Post reporter Jamal Khashoggi. Yet he said he needed them for leverage in dealing with the PGA. Reports have surfaced that Mickelson and Dustin Johnson were each paid in excess of $100 million to join. And while criticism has come their way, Live Golf's first U.S. event last week near Portland, Oregon was met with opposition by 11 local mayors who noted in a joint letter the human rights abuses carried out by the Saudi-backed sponsor. Oregon Senator Ron Wyden called it sports washing, where injustices are covered up by misusing athletics to normalize the abuses. I talked to James Ward, senior editor for Golf Today. 
He thinks the players that have defected are probably looking at the increased money and better schedules. I also think that some of the players that are signing up don't realize the implications of being involved with Saudi Arabia and what the money that they're receiving, what that, that, what that is attempting to do. I think this is an issue that is now becoming more of a front page item, not just in professional golf, but for all of sports. Uh, the NBA, as you just referenced, has had and continues to be uh, bedeviled by this issue. Besides the payouts Live Golf is offering its players to switch leagues, their $25 million event purses are more than anything the PGA Tour has ever offered. In addition, the rival tour reimburses players for all expenses incurred, which Ward says is substantial in and of itself. To play professional golf at the highest of levels, requires an inordinate amount of expenses. So travel logistics, um, you have a caddy, you're paying for the caddy, you're paying for any of your coaching that comes with that. The, the Saudi Arabian situation is picking up the entire tab of anybody who is connected to their orbit. Ward also notes that unlike in PGA events, where nearly half the golfers who don't make the weekend cut don't get paid, even last place finisher in Live Golf events walk away with $120,000. Live's next event is in Bedminster, New Jersey, starting on July 29. In basketball news, WNBA star Brittany Griner pled guilty today for bringing hashish oil into Russia. Her lawyer said she committed this act through negligence unintentionally. The sudden plea has come amidst growing attention paid to the case. Griner herself has reached out to the President of the United States through a handwritten letter that somehow found its way to the White House. Biden then spoke with Griner's wife, Sherelle. Her case has been adjourned until July 14th. In tennis news, Rafael Nadal, fresh off a five-set thrilling win over Taylor Fritz, has withdrawn from Wimbledon with a torn abdominal muscle. Nadal was seen hunched over in pain several times during the match against Fritz and had to call an injury timeout. His serve was noticeably slower and he was often seen wincing after his follow-throughs. In addition, he often preferred taking a drop shot instead of unleashing his trademark thundering forehand. With the withdrawal, Australia's Nick Kyrgios will advance to the finals to face the winner of the Novak Djokovic Cameron Nori match. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And finally, three of the world's rarest tigers were born at the London Zoo earlier this week. The first footage of the cubs is now released. So let's take a look. Geisha is a 10-year-old Sumatran tiger. She gave birth to three cubs on Monday at the London Zoo. We have seen a few key milestones already, which is very exciting. Um, we've seen them feeding and taking a first few tentative steps. They're very big and very strong. This footage is from a hidden camera operated by the Zoological Society of London, or ZSL. It shows Geisha giving birth and cleaning her cubs, followed by the cubs' father, Asim, approaching to meet his new family. The three new arrivals are a welcome boost to the global breeding program of this critically endangered uh, Sumatran tiger species, which is managed here at ZSL. The zoo will continue to keep a close eye on the tiger family using its special cub cam. Sumatran tigers, whose habitat is the jungles of Sumatra and Indonesia, are facing an extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. That's according to the IUCN Red List of Threatened Animals. The ZSL says there were about 1,000 Sumatran tigers in the wild in the 1970s. Now there are only about 300 left. The species faces a daily battle for survival, with threats of poaching, habitat loss, and human conflict. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.